second talk is uh, Casey McGuire from Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital, uh, the title of which is New AVs for Sensory Organ Targeting. Casey. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everybody for being here and thanks to the organizers and to the society for getting a chance to talk to you today. So on my first disclosure side, I'm a co-founder of Chameleon Biosciences. Um, I receive some um, sponsored research and I consult for different biotech companies. I have a second disclosure. I'm not an inner ear <laughs> biology expert. However, I work with a really good team with a lot of complementary um, expertise. Uh, Bents has done, has really spearheaded this work in the lab and David Corey at HMS is um, an expert in inner ear biology. And Marley Kenna is a um, pediatric otolaryngologist that has done some of the, you'll see some of the surgeries in non-human primates. Um, and we've had a really great collaboration on this work with, with Charles River. Um, so switching from the eye to the ear, I'm going to give, it's, it's been less studied um, than the eye and the CNS, so I'll give a little bit of background um, on hereditary deafness. Um, kind of some, some of the, uh, the pioneering studies that were, were done in, in the inner ear with AAV. And then recent advances in AAV technology that can mediate efficient transduction in the inner ear. So hearing loss affects 30 million American, uh, people in the U.S. Um, compared to about 6 million for Alzheimer's disease. About one out of every thousand births results in hearing loss with a genetic cause. And there's, I think this needs to be updated, but there's definitely greater than 70 known causative genes for hearing loss. And about two-thirds are recessive and one-third dominant. The most common uh, mutation is the GJB2 gene, which is the gap junction protein connecting 26, which is expressed in fibrocytes and supporting cells. But today I'm gonna to focus most of the talk on so-called hair cells, which are the sound sensing cells in the inner ear. And many deafness genes affect the function of these cells. It was surprising to me to learn that 90% of, uh, of, of deaf children are born to hearing pa uh, parents. And unlike the situation for um, uh, deaf children born to deaf parents, if um, uh, there can be communication issues, and if left unattended, you can have a lower quality of life for those, for those uh, children. And to uh, finally to mention, there's only 15,500 total hair cells we have at birth, and once they're gone, they don't regenerate unless you're uh, a lizard or a bird, which, which, which can do that. So it's really important to protect your hearing. <laughs> Um, so let me just give you a little diagram of the inner ear. Um, so we're going to be focusing on uh, the cochlea and the vestibule. So the cochlea contains the, the sensory cells of the inner ear, and the, vest the vestibule has, um, allows our uh, sense of motion and balance. And how do hair cells allow us to hear? They, um, the hair cells of the cochlea, they're called hair cells because they have these stereocilia on the surface, which look like little hairs. And they, um, they capture sound waves and turn it into a neural signal. Our brain recognizes the sound. And the hair cells of the vestibular system operate in a similar manner to provide information on motion and balance. And again, many of the deafness genes affect the function of the hair cells. <coughs> So basically, in the, in, the, in the bottom of the slide, you can see um, when uh, you have a tectorial membrane and when um, sound vibrates the fluid in your inner ear, it can actually push the um, basilar membrane into the tectorial membrane, which presses those uh, stereocilia, leading to mechanically gated ion channel opening, depolarization, and neurotransmitter release on the bottom of the cell to activate neurons. So gene therapy for hereditary deafness has, uh, has not advanced as fast as other gene therapies, m mainly due to inefficient transduction of sensory hair cells of the inner ear. And historically, AV can transduce inner hair cells quite well, but outer hair cells have, have been more difficult to transduce, and it's still not known uh, why, why that is. Um, and gene therapies to correct most diseases, not all, um, will need to rescue both inner hair cells and outer hair cells because um, the gene affects both types of cells. And outer hair cells can amplify sound by about 50 decibels. So you wouldn't get good rescue of hearing just targeting hair cells in most cases. 
So some of the opportunities for gene therapy, uh, we're gonna be focusing on gene addition or gene replacement therapy today. Um, for hereditary hearing loss, for dominant, you could use CRISPR in the hair cells. Um, acquired hearing loss, you could use regeneration. Um, and for uh, uh, other types of hearing loss, you could uh, correct the synaptic function of neurons through growth factors. So these are the injection routes that are typically used. In, um, the round window membrane injection is probably the most widely used where you inject into the, uh, the paralymph of the inner ear. Uh, you can also use a co cocleostomy, which you inject directly into the endolymph. Um, in our hands, or not my hands, but our collaborators' hands in, in mice, you can, um, you definitely get uh, more variability with a cocleostomy route. Um, and this is a cross-section of the inner ear, and um, let's see. Um, you can see uh, the outer and inner hair cells kind of in the middle of the, of the slide, the very tiny part. Um, they're surrounded by the different um, fluid compartments, the endolymph and the paralymph. So I'm gonna talk about some, some pioneering studies um, that really led us to where we are today. Uh, the first paper by um, Omar Akil showed that they could um, res rescue hearing um, in a mouse model of deafness uh, V-glute, it's a glutamate transporter, and it's actually only needed on inner hair cells um, to mediate uh, function. So they used an AAV1 vector, and it only transduced inner hair cells, but um, that was all that was necessary in this model, and they achieved efficient rescue of hearing um, measured by um, ABR's auditory brainstem responses. Then another paper came out, um, uh, Charles Askew and, and Jeffrey Holt's group which um, showed rescue of another deafness model, TMC1, uh, which is a, a transmembrane channel. And uh, again, uh, you can see on the left that they were able to achieve efficient transduction of inner hair cells shown on the bottom. But outer hair cell transduction was really a, a rare event. Um, and, they, and they did, by doing gene addition therapy with the wild type uh, allele, of TMC1, they were able to rescue hearing, but uh, as you can see, uh, it's really only to louder sound, so that would be um, like around 90 decibels, which would be a very, very loud sound. So um, from this work, uh, and it, I should mention, there was no um, DP rescue, which is a measurement of outer hair cell function. That's likely due to lack of the outer hair cell transduction. So targeting both inner hair cells and outer hair cells may improve this rescue. So based on these data, um, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of diseases, really conventional AV vectors won't suffice, at least according to the, the mouse models that we we're relying on. So I'm gonna talk about the state of, art for, um, state of the art for AV in the inner ear. So what are the most effective AV vectors for gene delivery in the inner ear? And do my, uh, the results that we're getting in mice regarding gene transfer, do they translate to non-human primates? So this was a really great study out of um, a collaboration between Jeff Holt and Luke Vandenberg's lab where they used um, a vector, that, or an AAV capsid, uh, ANC-80, that Luke had, um, Luke's group had uh, constructed from a library um, approach uh, a couple of years before, and they just tested it in the inner ear. And what they found was you achieved, um, compared to other stereotypes, you achieved really efficient transduction of both inner and outer hair cells seen here in um, and GFP, and then they, they actually went on um, to rescue a model in a mouse model of Usher syndrome type 1C, where they delivered the wild type cDNA for, um, uh, for Usher type 1C, which is, they did try, there's two different versions of, of the gene, hormone in A and B, and they found, um, you can see that the hormone in B was, gave the best rescue, and they really achieved really good rescue in the system. Basically, especially at the lower frequency ranges, they could get, um, rescue to very quiet sounds. So, uh, and, and uh, they also got DP rescue. So that kind of gave you an idea. If you get better outer hair cell transduction, you can get um, better rescue. And they also showed functional rescue of uh, startle, reflex, and, and uh, vestibular dysfunction. Around the same time, we had, um, we published this paper where we took a different approach. We had um, been developing a, a system in, in my lab for a number of years 
using uh, extracellular vesicles or exosomes. Um, and we basically found that uh, AV, a uh, population of AV can be uh, found in the media associated with these vesicles. And we found in, in several animal models in, in cell culture that you can, it acts to boost transduction. Um, so we just tested uh, XOAV uh, in the serotype AV1. That, that works well, but as you remember, it doesn't transduce the outer hair cells very well. And what we found is we could see um, really remarkable transduction of both inner and outer hair cells. The really bright green cells are inner hair cells and um, the lighter green are, are outer hair cells. Um, we went from uh, a quantitating GFP from base to apex. We were um, about 90% of inner hair cells and in outer hair cells we were um, around 25 to 30% of outer hair cells. We went on to uh, test this system in a mouse model of deaf deafness with TMH TMHS, and uh, we, f we found uh, uh, using um, ABR that we could rescue um, sounds down to about uh, uh, 70 decibels, which is about this, uh, the, the level of a loud conversation. So mice responded to um, startle reflex, uh, and we also um, um, largely rescued the vestibular dysfunction in these mice. So what was next for us? We really wanted to search for ideal AV capsids which would um, work well as a single-stranded vector, because in our um, paper we used, we found that XOAV1 and AV1, um, the, the best transduction was observed with self-complementary vectors, and we really wanted um, uh, a lot of genes, um, deafness genes, will fit in a self-complementary vector, but a lot won't. So um, to maximize the capacity of, of our system, we wanted to find a vector that worked well in single-stranded format. Um, and we wanted to improve transduction of outer hair cells. On average, we were transducing about <clears throat> 25 to 35, uh, 25 to 30 percent of outer hair cells from base to apex. So we we thought we could we can improve that and hopefully get better rescue. So we looked to this vector, which I'm I'm sure um, a lot of people uh, gained a lot of interest from um, uh, in the in the field for um, for a number of reasons uh, due to its efficiency. And you may ask. Um, so basically, it's an AV9. Um, PHPV has a, just a, a seven mer insert into the capsid after amino acid 588. It was selected from a library, and it mediates really robust transduction in mice. Um, and so you may ask, why were we going to try that for the inner ear? And I do know that hair cells are, are not neurons or astrocytes. So I, I know that much, but um, I was. We, we did have data showing that AV9 works with moderate efficiency at hair cell transduction, only in self-comp format. But we knew from um, this published work that the AV9 PHPV worked really well in a single-strand vector format. Um, so we, uh, we just tried to do the old college try and um, injected AV9 PHPV into neonatal mice uh, encoding GFP uh, through the round window membrane and then analyzed GFP five days later. And what we found really, um, I, was, I was shocked, we found uh, really robust transduction of the sensory epithelium, um, which has the inner and outer hair cells, and it seemed much more um, selective towards that area of the, of the cochlea. This is a higher magnification where you can see um, really nice transduction of both the inner and outer hair cells. Um, this was quantitated on many, uh, three litters of mice, um, 12 mice, and we get a, um, around 50% transduction of inner hair cells and uh, pushing uh, 30 to 40% of outer hair cells. Uh, we then put it into the XOAV format, and I have to uh, uh, caution that this has only been done once. We haven't quantitated it, but, but it did look um, at a lower dose um, extremely efficient. Um, we next wanted to see if there's any um, uh, strain differences with our findings based on some recent recent data. So that, that work that I've just shown you, the earlier work, was done in Black 6. So we tested it in CD1 mice, and again, we found that we could get really great transduction of inner and outer hair cells. I should mention then we've, we've done a, a rescue model for Usher syndrome type 3A. Um, that's going to be a talk by Benz Georgie today. Uh, at 4 p.m., so I highly recommend you check that out. But just to 
give away, steal a little bit of his thunder, we were able to achieve um, a nice rescue in this model down to um, you know, pretty low uh, uh, thresholds of, of uh, 40 or 50 decibels. We also went to another um, species, so we tested it in neonatal rats, and we were able to achieve uh, transduction in this, in this animal. And then we moved on to uh, non-human primates. So this group at um, Johns Hopkins, in a collaboration with Novartis, I believe, um, uh, published on using this transmastoid approach to inject in the, through the round window membrane. They just injected saline in, in preparation of, of viral vectors just to show that it was a safe procedure. And why would you go through, I mean, it's, it's a very involved uh, procedure to get to the, um, to get to the round window membrane. Uh, but the, inner, the architecture of the non-human primate is too small f to go trans-ear canal. Um, although, I have to say that in humans it can be done trans-ear canal, so um, it should be simpler in humans than, than what's being done in, in, in monkeys. So, with our um, pediatric otolaryngologist, Margaret Kenna, um, we started, and our collaborators at Charles River, uh, we had a, uh, a juvenile macaque that was injected via the round window with three times 10 to the 11th genome copies, basically 10 microliters. That was found in the previous work to be a safe volume for the, for the cochlea of AV9, PHPB, uh, encoding GFP in the right ear. Four weeks post-injection, injection, the animal was uh, sacrificed, temporal bone decalcified for three months. So I gotta, um, I gotta say this is the most frustrating part of these experiments. The temporal bone is like the hardest, most dense bone in the body. So you have to twiddle your thumbs for a long time before you get, before you get the data. But, um, and then once we did, they, we, uh, we stained for GFP expression. So this is the non-injected side, just with hematoxyl and counter stain, and then stained for GFP and DAB. And um, uh, we didn't see any, any um, uh, amino reactivity, suggesting that we didn't have any crossing of the vector to the, to the contralateral ear, and it was also a, a staining control for our reagents. But on the side of the, um, of the injected side with AB9 PHPB, this is looking at um, uh, different turns of the cochlea um, from base to apex. You can see a lot of uh, GFP amino reactivity. So um, we've, we've, we found this at the base, the mid base and the apex. And you can kind of see the, hopefully you can see the, um, uh, the organ of Cordy, which has the hair cells in the middle there. It's, it's very brown. And um, to our excitement, we found that both outer hair cells and inner hair cells were um, robustly transduced. And um, in this animal, again, this was our, our first animal. We, haven't, we have others coming up. Um, but we, we, uh, in all sections analyzed, we had complete transduction of, of inner and outer hair cells. We also saw the spiral ganglion neurons were, were, um, uh, were transduced as, ways, as well as the striovascularis. And it looked like we also had a widespread GFP expression in fibrocytes in the spiral limbus and the spiral ligament. So to conclude, um, uh, we found that AV9 PHPV mediates efficient transduction of hair cells in mice, rats, and juvenile non-human primates. And now we're, kind of, we're interested in, in seeing if the peptide sequence of PHPV really plays any role in the increased transduction compared to wild-type AB9 capsid, um, whether it's the peptide itself or it's just um, uh, causes some type of conformational change in the capsid. We'll try different inserts. Uh, we need to confirm the non-human primate studies in more subjects, which we're already, we, ha we already have going. Look at ABR pre and post dosing to make sure um, that the injection and, and vector expression is safe and doesn't harm hearing. Uh, and then we're going to perform talk studies um, of our clinical candidate, um, Claren One. Uh, so with that, I'd really like to thank you for your attention. Um, I need to thank again David Corey, a, a great collaborator. Um, and all this wouldn't be possible without his lab, Bence, who's really run a lot of these experiments, had a lot of great ideas. Uh, and Marley, the surgeon. And then people from my lab, Audrey, especially who packaged a lot of the vectors that were used in these studies. Um, other folks in David Corey's lab. And uh, Miguel Cena Estevez for providing the PHPV um, synthetic uh, plasmid. 
and finally our collaborators at Charles River. So with that, I uh, thanks again, and I'll, I'll take some questions if we have time. Okay, this paper is open for question. Hi. Thanks, uh, Casey. Really interesting. Thanks very much for the presentation. Just trying to understand the, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, comparison between XOAAV and the ANC80. You mentioned that both, you know, there's published information that both transduce uh, both inner and outer hair cells very efficiently. Have you, can you say something about a side-by-side -side comparison on a vector genome normalized basis? Mm -hmm. We haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison, okay. so I, I don't know if anybody else has. So I can't say, uh, okay. yeah, we haven't done it. Okay. But it would, yeah, it would be interesting for sure, yeah. Right. Just trying to think of the, the dose or the concentration of the respective vectors that went in to achieve a certain level of... Yeah, uh, I definitely think I, I have to go back and look at um, all the doses we used and, and that group used. I think um, they definitely weren't, this, they weren't the same doses, if I remember. Um, so, yeah, that would be um, an important undertaking. Um, I will say that, that uh, ANC80 did have the... Uh, it, it works well in single-stranded format, so I think that's, um, that, that kind of did lead us into trying to find vectors with some of the same properties. Thanks. Thanks. So I want to ask, yeah. uh, in the non-human primate data, you were getting transduction in plenty of cells outside of the yeah. hair cells. Yeah. Uh, just because I don't know, are there good yeah. reagents in terms of compact promoters where you could restrict expression when you need to? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's not as many promoters um, in the, in, identified in the inner ear that will really work well and fit well in, in AAVs. I think. Um, there's some elements like I think myo7a uh, that that might that might fit some of some of the elements, but um, yeah, it's something that I think we're going to be screening and working with collaborators to find ways to restrict expression. But there's not as many widespread ones as like synapsin or GFAP, like like the like the CNS. So, hey Charles, how you doing? Hey Casey, hey. Yeah. good talk. Thanks. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you plan to inject other serotypes. Um, and I think it's a really interesting point that you brought up about the, either the identity of the peptide or the location in the capsid that you're putting it in. Yeah. Um, I've heard that 7M8 actually does well, 7M8 also does well yeah. in cochlea, and it's in a similar location in AV2. Um, so uh, I was just wondering if you're planning to look at other serotypes, because it would be interesting to compare um, yeah. just the parental serotypes to these peptide insertion mutants. Yeah. You, do you mean like put the same insert into multiple serotypes, or just um, um, just in general, just test the different the peptide being different identity? Yeah. Whether that holds a greater influence over the over the transduction profile, or whether just inserting into that location, like in that 588 region in any yeah. serotype. Yeah. Is no, I I think that would be a good good experiment. We're definitely gonna try to figure out if it has any role in in transduction or not. Thanks. Berta Uricchio from TGM in Italy. Uh, were you able to see in the non-human primate cochlea spontaneous GFP fluorescence, or did you need the, the immunohistochemistry to see transgene expression? Oh, were yeah. the levels high enough uh, to be evident? No, it's, it's all immunostaining. Because, um, it, it's, uh, it's formalin fixed sections, paraffin embedded, which from what you everybody tells me, kills the GFP fluorescence. So we wouldn't know anyways. So you have to do um, permeabilization, sure. staining with primary and secondary antibodies, and DAB development. Yeah. Is it accurate to say you're, you're moving away from exosome-associated AAV, or do you still uh, view that as yeah. a... I think the, the way we're thinking of it is that um, in terms of a clinical path, uh, AAV has a more rapid path to, uh, uh, you know, going um, yeah. for, for a clinical candidate right now. But I do see as we develop the XOAV technology, it does have some benefits such as um, co-packaging of capsids, which we may um, may be beneficial, and um, and some some ability to evade pre-existing antibodies. It's not known really in the cochlea how much of an issue that that will be, um, yeah. uh, but it could have some benefits. So I don't think it seems to. Um, that technology seems to boost transduction at lower doses, so um, it may be useful in that context as well. So we're definitely not abandoning it, but um, I think we're um, 
this capsid, if it works well enough on its own um, in non-human primates, I think we can, we can move with that. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're supposed to keep all the sessions synchronized, so I'm just going to take like a two-minute break before I introduce the next speaker. Uh, good time to check your email. Yes.